Hey, I'm Vinu. And I'm Jessica. And our talk is actually going to be answering that last question that someone asked regarding resource utilization and how we're tracking it. That's what chargeback is for. Chargeback is the ability to track and measure infrastructure resource usage on a per engineering team basis and to charge them the cost accordingly. So we built chargeback because we wanted visibility and accountability into how our infrastructure resource consumption is like. Particularly, we had these primary questions. The first one being, how well utilized are, is our infrastructure? Secondly, how do we map these infrastructure resources back to the organization? In other words, who owns what resource? Third, who is accountable for better capacity planning and driving resource utilization? And lastly, given that we're not a public cloud where users are often more responsible with their resource consum consumption, how do we incentivize that right behavior to drive efficiency? Let me talk to you about some of the engineering challenges we faced along the way in answering these questions. As you can see, Twitter infrastructure can be complex. We have a variety of infrastructures from compute services such as Aurora, Mesos, Hadoop, to storage systems like Manhattan, Blobstore, etc. These infrastructure offers disparate resources to its customers. The key challenge here is how to track the usage across these different resources in a unified, generalized way despite its complexities and in inconsistencies. Keeping this in mind, as we started designing the system, we identified top three challenges. Number one, resource catalog. This answers the primary question for a multi-tenant system. What is a resource? The second one is service identity. How do we establish ownership of a resource to a multi-tenant system? And how can we collect and meet a resource usage, resolve owners, and compute cost in a particular granularity is covered by usage pipeline. Let me deep dive a bit into the resource catalog. Back when Twitter was a single monolithic Ruby on Rails application, it was easier to model capacity, understand cost, when everything was bare metal machines. But things became complex as and when our underlying infrastructure evolved to accommodate Twitter's move into service-oriented architecture. We got to a point where we are not thinking about servers anymore, but abstract resources. For example, a storage system like Manhattan uses reads per second, writes per second, GB stored as their resources. In fact, as we moved higher up the stack, the resources became even more abstract. Our core platform services offer tweets served per second as a resource. In short, resource is something that drives the overall capacity of a system. The next step is figure out how to charge these resources. This was particularly challenging and we had to build policies to ensure the unit prices capture the total cost of ownership. For example, we defined our unit price from the bottom up, that is, from the bare metal layer where we incur true cost to buy the physical machines. We calculated cost per server per day and included capex and opex cost of machines, license cost, headroom, inefficiencies, utilities and human cost to run these resources. This formed the basis of how we define the unit price for other services as we moved up the stack. We built a generic entity model to capture both the various infrastructure resources and the unit price of every infrastructure service at Twitter. This is based on Kimball's dimension modeling. I'll talk about this next, but before that, there is one important point we need to consider before defining a resource. Very similar to public clouds, we account for change in cost over the period of time. This helped us define the granularity of the measured data over any period of time. The grain is exclusively determined by few constraints such as 
the volume of the data, the source of truth, etc. It is very essential to define the granularity of the resource as it affects all the aspects of the design from ETL processes that fetch the data to the generated reports that use the data. At Twitter, we decided to go with day as a granularity as it was easily trackable and maintainable to measure an impact. Let me walk you through our entity model. Let's review this from bottom up. As mentioned earlier, the unit price of a resource is captured as offering measure cost entity. It is a time varying dimension model that captures the changes in the unit price over a period of time. In our case, we review the prices and change the unit price every quarter. And resource itself is captured by the offering measure entity. This alone cannot define what we are measuring and costing out. It is important for us to provide more context in the form of clusters which we call as offerings or infrastructure service or providers. Providers can either be the internal data center or public clouds like AWS or Google Cloud Platform, etc. Let me show how our entity model mapped to a simple and a complex infrastructure service. We are taking Aurora and Hadoop as our examples. Aurora offers compute as which measures, uh, which is measured in core days. On the contrary, infrastructure like Hadoop offers clusters as their offering where we store and process the data with measures such as GB RAM, accesses, uh, number of accesses per day, etc. We were not only able to onboard Aurora and Hadoop, we were able to onboard other similar infrastructure services like Manhattan, Blob Store, etc. because our entity model was able to capture these disparate resources in a very consistent way. We work with each individual infrastructure team to identify the resource and subsequently work with the capacity planners and finance team to define their unit price. Again, these unit price are not some random numbers, but are aligned with the real cost as close as possible. Now that you have learned our entity model around the resource cataloging for multi-tenant infrastructure system, let us take a look at our next challenge. So our next challenge is service identity, and that's given a multi-tenant infrastructure resource, how do we map it back to the correct owners? First, let's appreciate the problem. The problem is that there's a lack of a strong association between a owner and a resource. This is primarily due to the scale of Twitter's infrastructure, but also because each infrastructure is siloed in terms of their identification and provisioning systems. So continuing with the previous example where we use Aurora and Hadoop, we can see from the slides that they actually have very different identification formats. So the first problem is having to find a way to normalize this. Secondly, as a developer, if I wanted to request resources from both of these infrastructures, I would have to go through very different provisioning workflows. With Aurora, I would have to go through their own self-serve mechanism to re request the CPU cores that I need and I would have to file a JIRA ticket at Twitter to get Hadoop resources. So again, very different provisioning workflows, and this is a pain point for developers because it increases the latency and the time it takes to get a service up and running. Another problem is that because there's nothing guaranteeing that the service account I'm using to request Hadoop resources is the same service account that I'm using to request Aurora re resources, there's nothing enforcing that these resources belong to the same owner. Another complication is that we have a variety of ownership tracking systems, such as LDAP and email, which if there can be ambiguity if we have a restructuring or um, someone leaving the organization. So the approach here is to have a single pane of glass for every developer to come and manage all of their infrastructure resources and project IDs. That way we solve the um, separate provisioning workflow problem that I mentioned in the previous slide. And how we're accomplishing this is by facilitating a set of APIs and interfaces um, that infrastructure providers can then integrate with and implement. 
This also solves that problem that we mentioned earlier with the um, disparate ID formats across different infrastructures. The system will also serve as the single source of truth for identifier to organization structure mapping. So no more of that ambiguous um, owner systems. And the key takeaway here is that with service identity, we're really enabling service, an easy way to do service to service authorization and authentication and a platform that allows anyone to easily be able to query and figure out who owns what resources. So in order to implement the approach that I mentioned earlier, we needed to define an entity model. So again, if we start from a bottom-up perspective, let's look at a client ID. So a client ID is the primary identifier that a service is going to use to talk to a infrastructure. Above that, we have a service account, which can have one to many client IDs. And a service account is a primary use for authorization. In the case of Twitter, it is an LDAP. A service can have one or more service accounts depending on its ACL requirements. And a service belongs to a project. A project belongs to a cost center. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a cost center, but it could be any business unit depending on your organization's needs, such as a team or a department. So with this model, we can now easily extract the owner given a infrastructure's client ID. Now that we've discussed how to define resource and how to identify the owner of a resource, let me give you a high-level overview of our, of our system. We built a modular service to handle various stages of the process, such as data ingestion, all the way up to generating reports. We essentially worked with every infrastructure system owner to push their resource usage through our HTTP API. The ingested data, which has the measures and the client IDs are stored in our raw fact tables. This raw fact data is then transformed using our data transform service. We query the service identity and resource catalog models to compute the cost for these various measures and also attribute to its rightful owners. The transform data is then stored in our resolve fact table. Data fidelity is performed on these resolved data as it is very key to us. And we built a system where we alert both our, we have two kinds of customers there. One is our infrastructure owners we want to alert them whenever there is a missing data through the pipeline and we also wanted to alert them on high fluctuations of data usage or cost changes. <coughs> our second customers for data quality is our service owners. We want to again alert our service owners when there is high fluctuation or low fluctuation in their data changes so that they can either acknowledge the change that it was expected or they can resolve if something went wrong there. Finally, the data is used to generate a number of reports. As an internal UI, we show the monthly usage and computed cost for these usage. We also have custom utilization reports with detailed drill downs up to the project level. So when you find a high cost or high uh, volume, the customer can nail down this particular project is where it's happening. Data is also available for use by data visualization tools like such as Tableau and we consume the data there. This is a sample of a result fact table. Now that the chargeback system is in place, let's talk about the impact. So we actually have a considerable amount of measurable impact and use cases. We now have a generalized way of viewing and computing unit prices for a very disparate infrastructure system. With better visibility into our infrastructure spend, we can also notice a huge improvement in terms of resource utilization. A good example is with Aurora. With the insight from chargeback, Aurora actually um, drove resource utilization by almost 30%. We also created an accountable organization structure and a sense of ownership of resources through chargeback. Another use case is the users of our monitoring service that, use char sorry, that uses chargeback to save on the number of metrics written, which led to a significant um, increase in savings. And of course, chargeback is also being used by our finance team for uh, capacity planning and uh, better resource utilization 
or sorry, budgeting. So chargeback and identity is only a smaller part of a, a vast system that we're building. We're gonna be calling this system Kite, and it's gonna encompass many areas of the service management lifecycle, including things like metering, deploy, and um, metadata. So if you're interested, uh, stay tuned to our engineering blogs and future talks where we'll talk more about it. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the other infrastructure teams at Twitter who helped us build chargeback and work on the efficiency of our resource utilization. And this is our team. We are hiring. So <laughs> if you love the product, do come talk to us. And if you have any questions, we can answer some questions. We have plans around how we are using data quality. The first step is to just give you the visualization of um, any fluctuations there. Uh, I'm sorry, again, the question is any plans to utilize the data quality to automate the change of or avoid the data? So yes, we wanted to initially give you that there is a fluctuation of data. But going forward, if you know, probably your service never requires such kind of fluctuation over any period of time, we can build rules against it to automatically maintain um, that state. Does that answer your question? Um, right now, again, like the question is, do you want to make a spot instance market where um, you want to achieve, you want to achieve 100% utilization? Uh, right now, we don't have any plans for it, but keep, again, looking at our engineering blocks, mm -hmm. and you'll definitely find it out there if we decide to do that. Last question. Um, so the question is whether do you want to do chargeback only till engineering uh, level, or do you want to extend it all the way up to the business level? The answer is yes. One of the ideas of chargeback is it doesn't stop just with the physical layer or the uh, Manhattan storage system. The system is we started with the physical layer. We identified who are our top customers at physical layer and then we start we in, we onboarded them into chargeback. So similarly as we go from the bottom up the topmost is the business. Right? So we also will identify who are the top layers and the, the cost will be distributed equally amongst all the teams in the company. Thank you. And if you have any questions, we can take it offline. Yeah.